Now, the heading of this message is that forgiveness shifts the heavens, and I want to prove it to you tonight. So I want to read from uh, um, verse 1 of chapter 6. Now, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. I want you to underline in your Bible the number, the word number, because it shows you that here was an increase in the Christian church. Praise God. So you can write in your margin, increase. But suddenly there was this complaint because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Now I want you to see how the disciples reacted. Then the 12 summoned the multitude of disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now my brothers and sisters, some people would, would say yeah, they were full of pride that they didn't want to go and serve the widows now. But these guys did not want to be distracted by teaching the word and let people pray. Are you with me? So now they say, no, we must make another plan. We therefore, brethren, seek out from among you and align seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So say, we are looking for certain people. They must be full of the Holy Spirit. And what did they have to do? They had to look after the widows. And it's nice to me that they said, they must be full of the Holy Spirit and they must have wisdom. So this shows you that even if you look after widows, you have to be full of the Spirit of God. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Please underline that because this was their highest priority. They had to teach the word and they had to pray. So this job was not their anointing. Remember sometime during this week I said, you must always know what your anointing is and move within your anointing, don't compete. And here these guys knew exactly what their anointing was and what the highest priority was. So they were aligned with God's purposes for their lives. And the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and then all those other guys, and then Nicholas, the last one, a proselyte from Antioch. So they chose one man with a lot of guys to do this job. When they set before the apostles, so they brought them to the apostles, and what did they do? And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. So what did they do? They commissioned them into this job of theirs. My brothers and sisters, and this is the way I live, I don't go anywhere in the world if I don't let my pastors pray for me and send me out. And when I come back from Europe or wherever, that they will send me back with a blessing. But you know what it also means? If people lay hands on you, that's what I believe, they send you out in their anointing, so your anointing increases by your submission. Amen. So these guys understood this principle. And then it says, then the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Even some of the priests came to the Lord. And this was about a, a progress report from about, of about five years. Then the story goes on and now, we learn about this amazing man called Stephen. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the, the people. But look how they define him. You can put in your, in your margin a C with a circle around him. That is when God comes and he shows us a, or reveals a character. He was full of faith and power, and then he did great wonders too. Then some of them arose from what is called the synagogue of freed men, disputing with Stephen. So they were fighting with him too. See, the wonderful thing is this. Once you are moving in the anointing of God, you will get people that will stand up against you. So the resistance will always be there. And it's a good thing for you to be resisted because it helps you to hold faster onto the Lord 
and to get, yeah, I think in the place of a deeper and deeper humility, if there's something like that, that people just say, Father, it's okay. I think when I, when I came to the Lord in the beginning and I came into a ministry and a prayer ministry and then I started to research, so many people resisted me. And I, I can't tell you how many. And sometimes it was so hurtful, but sometimes I didn't walk in much humility. I would just say, it's because you don't, you don't read, you know, know so little, that's why you are resisting me. That was pride. And then I had to repent about it again. Amen. But now they were disputing with Stephen, but they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. This is an important scripture. This is something that you can pray for the missionaries, the word that you can pray for your own pastor, that you can pray for us as we're moving out from the country to go and minister. Amen. That we will be so full of the of the Holy Spirit that they will not be able to resist the wisdom by which we are speaking. We need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 11, then they secretly, and aligned secretly, induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. What happened in the case this, the, in the previous session or two sessions ago? Through lying, Naboth lost his vineyard, uh, his vineyard and his life. So when you move in your anointing, and this is the good news, people sometimes secretly speak behind your back about you. That's when I pray for myself. I say, Father, all the soft-spoken words over me, words behind the walls, I cut them off from me. They will not influence me in the name of Jesus. That is good advice to you. We heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him to the council. So what happened now? As he was speaking the word, as he was moving by the spirit, the devil started to resist him. But it was also God's plan, and I'll show it to you now. They also sent up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous, blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Watch out the law. They were obviously Jews speaking against him and, and, and st uh, stirring up the people against him. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. This religious spirit was attacking him. And then it goes on, and all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face was like that of an angel. You know, I don't understand that scripture really. I tried to look it up on, on my computer and my programs today, but nobody gave any explanation about that. But I think God did change his face at that moment, that he had this heavenly look on his face. And to me, it's so amazing that this man could come and under these circumstances and he could come and just explain to them who Jesus was. And I want you to look at this overhead that I've got here. Uh, and I'm sorry that this thing is going like this. I want you to think about the three heavens again. So here was Stephen in full contact with God and Jesus, because I'll speak about Jesus just now, I've sp split him and God apart, because just to show you that Stephen was also in him, but he was standing under a whole spiritual realm of Judaism, different names of all these gods, the Greek gods, or, or names like Plato, Socrates, and all these guys, the queen of heaven, he was also standing under the mixture of paganism, the of the cosmology, of Caesar, the empire spirit that ruled through Caesar, through the spirit of nemesis, the spirit of revenge and retribution. That is what the spirit of ne nemesis is all about. And then all the philosophies. He was under this, that spiritual realm, but he was in contact with God all the time. But Paul this moment in time, it was still Saul. That's why he's got his little hair like that. Was still standing under the influence of Judaism. 
and he was also a, an amazing academician. So now he was watching the story because he was the one who was ordering the Romans and the Jews to kill off these Christians. It was, it's, it's written in the Bible close, uh, quite explicitly that Paul ordered even Stephen's death. So let's jump now over chapter 7. And now St St uh, Stephen goes and he tells him the whole story of salvation. Right from Moses, right up to Jesus. And then in verse 54, I'm taking you there of chapter 7. He told them the whole story about Jesus. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. And they gnashed with him. It's a nice English word. Gnash in Afrikaans. I said, and a little tannige knars. Also a good word. Let me just get this away. Wi-Fi network is intruding here. And they looked at him, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven... Amen. And saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And there Jesus was standing next to God, although they won. And I said to the Lord, Lord, why is Jesus standing? It's the only place in the Bible where it says that Jesus stood up from the throne. The only place. You can go and research that. And he saw Jesus, and he was looking in the heavens. And this is how I imagined myself. And he said, look, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Above him was an open heaven. Because he was so connected to the Lord, and that's what Elizabeth taught us this afternoon, that we must be so connected in Jesus that we will see him standing at the right hand of the Father, or even sitting at the right hand of the Father. He had this open heaven, he had this open vision. And then he came and he said something amazing. They, uh, they did something amazing. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. So they wanted to just kill him off for uh, telling them what he's seeing. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses lay down their clothes at the feet of a young man called Saul. So Saul was standing next to this whole scene, and he was seeing everything that was happening to Stephen. Oh, Mike, this thing of mine doesn't want to work, really. And he, he saw everything. And, he, and they stoned Stephen, and he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He never said one ill word at them. It doesn't even say that he cried or that he said, are you hurting me? Because the connection with Jesus was so strong that he was totally in the spirit. And then something awesome happens. And they stoned Stephen and he was calling on God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried, cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, I am really of the contention that Stephen did not even feel one stone. Because, of course, he was totally in the spirit. He, had came, he came to the end of what we call the Omega anointing. We've got an Alpha anointing, and our anointing must go up till we have our Omega anointing, till the anointing leaves us and we go home. Are you with me? And here we see the Omega anointing. Till the end, he knew who Jesus was and he kept his eyes only fixed on God as they were throwing the stones at them. Now, we must look at Paul too. Paul stood there. And when this man started to speak, Stephen, forgive them because they do not know what they do. Sorry that this thing is buckling like this, this finger of mine you can't see there. But Saul saw everything. And I want you to see how strong forgiveness is. He heard this man saying, Lord Jesus, don't charge them with the sin. 
Because at that time when he said these words, he connected himself with what Jesus did on the cross when he said, forgive them before they do not know what they do. And here he comes into the position of a mediator between Jesus and God and Saul. I want you to see this. This is what intercession is all about. We mediate with the Lord about certain people and conditions. Now, this is to me so awesome because Paul, now Saul, was consenting to his death. So Paul was really a murderer. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And the devout man carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging of men and women, committing them to prison. Now suddenly this man was making havoc. I mean, it seems as if he's become worse. Amen. So I want you to see that Paul was totally bound. Although Stephen was bound, he was free because he could keep his eyes on the cross, knowing where forgiveness is, and by forgiving Paul, and you'll see it now, he spoke out the mercy of God over Paul. He really prophesied with his life, dying as he was dying over Paul's life and the plan that God had for Paul. And then, if you look at this again, this forgiveness started to affect the heavenlies. Because when we forgive, it is not a natural thing. Forgiveness is totally supernatural. And I want to read something to you that Regina, my friend, gave me tonight when she came here. Well, she's just read a book called Total Forgiveness which was then my leading <laughs> that I've really heard the Lord correctly about the teaching tonight. Total forgiveness, and I'm sorry I didn't have time to write it down. I do not feel resentment or a distance. I do not name his or her sin any longer. I do not want to make him her or her feel guilty or even uncomfortable in my presence. Is that easy? No. I want to protect him or her. And Joseph took in his brothers and gave them the land and even provided for them. That is a form of total forgiveness. Amen. Because he totally forgave them. So I want to ask you tonight, do you think we can forgive as Stephen forgave? by locking into the cross and say, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they do. Can we forgive the farm, the murderers of the farmers like that? Or people that have raped children, young black girls that have been raped, disgraced. Can we say, Father, we forgive them? Totally. I think we must grow to get to that position. But if you see tonight what happened now, after this forgiveness, I think God will help us more and more to get there. Now, let's go and see what happens now. Go to, please turn to Acts 8 from verse 29. From verse 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? Now, I mean, you can interpret this as you want to, but I believe this was a prophetic declaration that the Lord has written down here from the life of Philip, that he went to this Ethiopian who was reading the book of Isaiah. And what was he reading? He was reading about Jesus. 
So I want to read this to you. Just stay with me. And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. As a, as a lamb, excuse me, before its shearer is silent. So he opened it, not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. This man comes and he confirms what Stephen was doing, forgiving them. Because they did not know what they do. So this had a huge, gigantic move. Or brought about a gigantic move in the spiritual realm over Paul. Because the word was now even declared. And this was before Paul even was saved. And so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, whom does this prophet say this of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. But I believe he didn't only preach Jesus to this man. He also preached it in the spirit to Paul who was killing off the Jews or the Christians rather. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. My brothers and sisters, this is so important that he made this declaration because in the spiritual realm, it opened up, I believe, the way for Paul to come to the Lord Jesus. That's why it's important when we go into the nations, that is exactly what Elizabeth said, that we preach, although nobody is listening, that you declare, because in the spiritual realm, things happen when you declare the word of God, because light is brought into that spiritual realm. Amen. Do you agree with me? So we have to come and say, this is the truth. Jesus has come to die for everyone in Pretoria. And we can all be redeemed through his blood that he uh, 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 gave us on the cross. Amen. Now when they came up, up, out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. Now, this whole scenario, to me, when you can think, I'm, when you go home and you think about it again, you reread it. There's so much in it that the spiritual realm was being prepared for, the, I believe, for one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. Because God had a plan, but he used even a eunuch. He didn't even know he was used. Philip was taken away in the spirit. But they were used to open up the way for Paul. Now, it's amazing. And I want to just go on to my next slide. As Stephen died, he forgave him. So he looked at the cross and Jesus was standing there encouraging him. And he said, Stephen, don't give up. Forgive him. Forgive him. You've learned that. Yet I'm standing. I'm encouraging you. Forgive this man. I've got a plan for him. Now, now I, I give my own words now, but you can, in chapter 9, see what was in God's plan. What was God's heart for Paul. And so in the spirit, the forgive through forgiveness the light that was spoken or was living, uh, lived, the life, the power of the gospel that we see in chapter 8, the salt that was strewn out, the mediator that was declared, Jesus, all came and they influenced him. And it came through the spiritual realm, and I'm so sorry this thing doesn't work, but I've heard it yet. Through this, uh, through this uh, whole spiritual realm, through all the heavens, and now Jesus was standing watching. And now slowly but surely the light came to influence Paul. And his heart changed when he died. When he laid down his life, he could give life 
to another person by de declaring the words of the Messiah. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. He had to go to Damascus and ask, uh, because he saw how this, the Christians were growing and he needed letters from the high priest. So he went to the highest authority and asked letters for, from, from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found anyone who were on the way, whether men or women, he might buy, bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he had the spirit of revenge in his heart all the time, the spirit of nemesis. And it's a spirit that I see in our country. And I want to just tell you the story about the spirit of nemesis and then I'll go on with the word teaching. In 1990, we prayed. I had a prayer group in my home since 79 by the grace of the Lord. We prayed every week for three, four hours. And that day, God gave one of the ladies in our group a vision. And she's now with the Lord, but when she spoke, she was very quiet. We always listened because we knew it was from the throne room of God. And at that time, she saw a riverbed and out of the riverbed came a, a man half naked. And in his hand, he had a spear. And the Lord said to her, this is the spirit of nemesis. And we didn't know what it, was, what it meant. So we had to go and look it up. And then we found out it is the spirit of revenge and retribution. We often see the word retribution in our newspapers, don't we? And, the sp and we can see the revenge through all the murders and things that are taking place. And it's not only black on white, it's also black on black and white on white. So a whole nation is moving in this kind of spirit, exile your cry. It's a typical, typical Afrikaans expression, I'll get, I'll get you. But that is not from God, because God operates in forgiveness. To forgive is to set people free. And what he did here was to demonstrate to us this religious spirit that persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. And God, by using this through his Holy Spirit, wants to show us what forgiveness can do to the world. Remember, this was a global thing that happened to Paul. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light, hallelujah, shone around him from heaven. And I want you to see his reaction. Then he fell to the ground. As soon as he fell to the ground, he came to a place of humility, and I believe God hit him off that horse. I really believe that. He heard a voice saying to him, the place where you hear is when you're on your face. You cannot listen to God in an elevated position. Forget it. And here this high and mighty man, with all the power he had, with all his intellect, with his education, was flat on the ground, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So God saw the attack on the Christians as attacks on him. And from this basis, we can pray for the martyrs worldwide. And say, Father, Will you confront so-and-so who are persecuting you in such and such a country? Speak to them. And as God spoke to Paul for the first time, there was a shift in the heavens. Because the influence over Paul from the demonic realm didn't work anymore. Because the mighty one was speaking. And he said, this is amazing. Who are you, Lord? He knew it was God speaking to him. Then the Lord said, I like the majesty in God here. It's so ma majestic. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick 
against the goats. So he said, you are persecuting me. Who do you think you are? With this big club, I showed you who I am. But now, so he, trembling and astonished. I love the way that they translated this in the Bible. Such amazing English. Said, Lord, what do you want me to do? This man had an instant, instant change. Because he was confronted, and I want you to listen carefully, not only with God, but with the destiny that God had in his heart for him. He was confronted with his whole future. Amen. Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into this city and you will be told what you must do. This is amazing. God said, I'm not going to show you my own plan. Now first get up, Buti. Now you get up and you learn obedience. So write in your margin obedience. And go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So now you're going into the next phase so that I can use you. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. So, I mean, the fear of God fell on all of them. And isn't it amazing that Paul was the only one who could really see at this time. And the, those around them could see, but they couldn't understand. They were just astonished. And the men who journeyed with him were speechless. They didn't even say, wow. They said, Nooks, nothing. Then Saul arose from the ground. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Now, well, one day I've read this scripture so many times in my life because it's to me one of the most fascinating passages in the Bible. Now I asked the Lord many questions around it because now Paul is going into a seasonal change, but suddenly he is blinded. Why did God blind him? I believe God blinded him so that he could cut Paul off from his worldly mission so that he could start learning to see in the spirit what God wanted him to do. So he could see, and that there's that amazing scripture that we get in, in Revelations, where you say, Father, we buy eyes saw from you to put on our eyes that we can see. But here God blinded him to cut him off from the world that influenced him, so that he could learn to see in the spirit. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. Do you think it must have been a shock to him? I think he was totally shocked. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. It's an amazing piece of scripture. He was three days without sight. So he was in the grave, in the cave like Jesus was. And here is like a shadow, or you won't say shadow, just a joining up of him and Jesus. Because now he had to learn to see in the spirit. And he didn't eat or drink. This is the only other place that I know of in the Bible, you can help me if I'm wrong, where we see this full Esther fast again. Three days he didn't eat nor drink. So God brought him, I think, and you can test me on this, also he combines this experience with that of Esther's to show that he will now become a king in the spirit, but not in the flesh. Because she was a queen in the flesh, but she was also a queen in the spirit. Amen. So for these few days, he was also cut off from his flesh, in a way, so that he could just come into this kingly position, the, on par with her. Now, something amazing happens. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, 
And he said, here I am, Lord. God spoke to him in a vision. I've never heard God speaking to me in a vision. You might just see something, and I'm not a very big vision seer. Few things that I've seen a vision, I think I can count on one hand plus one thumb. But some people see visions all the time. And I'm jealous of them. But I think perhaps God does other things to me that, yeah, he does things to me that, or let me experience things that they can't experience. But Ananias heard in the vision and he saw God and God spoke to him. He said, Ananias, here I am, Lord. That's how well he knew the Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. I mean, this man just developed so quickly. This was totally supernatural. Because now he suddenly learned how to pray. And the Lord gave these instructions and told him that it was Saul of Tarsus. And he said to him, go to the street and go and inquire about this man. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Verse 12 shows us now that Paul was also having a vision and he saw Ananias coming towards him so that his sight could be uh, uh, returned to him. Now, my brothers, this is amazing to me, how God suddenly spoke to Paul. You know, I've often heard myself saying over the years that I've been saved, yeah, I'm not a big dreamer. I'm not a big vision seer, but perhaps those who see so many visions but lay hands on me that I might see more visions. But perhaps I'm just different from the others who see all these many visions. I'm not so charismatic perhaps, but perhaps the Lord has given me the ability to understand the scriptures in a different way or to analyze the scriptures by, by the Spirit. So, you see, we must never compete with this. But Paul got this vision. He saw Ananias and also that what he was coming to do for him. Put his hands on him so he learned Christian principles so that he could receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard heard from many about this man. How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind us all who call on your name. He said, but no, you are making a big mistake here. Don't you know about this guy? He's persecuting us. You see, God knows everything. And just this little story from my life. When in 1983, when they called me in those days still at Hatfield to come and lead the intercessors, and there were 350 of them. I said exactly the same words to the Lord. I said, you must be joking. I said, look at Auntie Betty Cook and all these grand guys. I can't do this, Lord. I'm young. I don't have any experience. Who am I to lead all these people? I don't have any knowledge. I think you make a mistake, Lord. And I sat in my big as a chair at home, a big rocking chair. And then God spoke to me and gave me, and I heard he spoke to me, Jeremiah 1. Seven, eight, and nine. And there he said, today, I've put my words in your mouth. The whole thing about warfare, and you'll overthrow kingdoms, and you'll raise them up, but you'll also build and plant. And in those days, I didn't even understand that scripture. And I said to him, what do you want me to do? And then I said, okay, here I am. I will walk this way. Now, I'll sit here before you because you said, I will teach you by my spirit. I will teach you all things by my spirit. And by the grace of God, all the teaching I'm giving, everything was taught to me by the Holy Spirit. Isn't God good and faithful? And I said, thank you, Father, that you will come now and help me also in the way that you've chosen me to go. And here, I will not complain any longer. I will not say, take that one and this one. Here I am, Lord, Burki in this English church, but here I am, help me. But the Lord said to him, now listen carefully to this amazing scripture. Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine 
to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And there in chapter 15, ach, verse 15, God comes and defines his destiny. But I want you to see that it took a man, Stephen, to lay down his life, to say, forgive him, because he does not know what he do, what he does, because Stephen could see further. He saw Jesus standing, and this is what I ask of you. Before you start thinking the Lord can't use Malema, Julius Malema, God's got a plan for him. God's still got a plan for Auntie Winnie. God's got a plan for many people. But you and I must ask the Lord to show us, not to look at the things that they do wrongly, but Father, what can they do and what can they mean to your kingdom? And then the Lord said, this is his destiny. He must take my name before Gentiles, before kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So God said he will even suffer for me. And Ananias went his way in obedience and entered the house and laying his hands on him said, this to me is so beautiful, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is so awesome because immediately when he said, Ananias said to him, brother, it shows me that he said, I am now in a relationship with you. Amen. Here I am for you, and I'm going to help you to see again, because the Lord said, I must put my hands on you, that you can see again, and then the addition, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Awesome. Immediately, the Lord and the wait, there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once. And then the amazing thing, and he arose and was baptized. It went very quickly with Paul. So once he received his sight, he could enter the waters and show and demonstrate to the spiritual realm, I have died with him, and now I am, I have risen. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Only some days. It's amazing how the Lord downloaded knowledge in this man so quickly, in three days. He was just downloaded with so much knowledge and wisdom and insight because he was this chosen vessel. I think it's a, a scripture verse that one can pray over people and say, Father, this person has accepted you. Show them that they are a chosen vessel. Show them for what you've called them. Amen. Immediately, I like the immediately St. Paul. He was a mover man. He was a shaker. Immediately, he preached the Christ, uh, Christ in the synagogues. Now, I want you to see the change that this man made so quickly. The Lord just came, and he allowed him to preach immediately in the synagogues. Why could he preach in the synagogues immediately? Because he was also a Jew of the Jews. So he knew how to swing his whole uh, uh, way of thinking change his thinking how to reach these people with truth. The Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. So he started preaching Jesus immediately. Then all who heard were amazed and said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? Can you see the Christians were all informed, and they knew that Paul was coming to come and catch them. So they must have made plans already how to get away. But Paul, up at Saul, increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. And I like this sentence or phrase, proving that Jesus was the Christ. 
Why could the Lord use him in such a way? Because he knew Judaism. He knew it. So he knew how to tell them, I, I, I'm, I'm sure he did, about Isaiah 53. Tell them, there you've read in the prophets about him. I, he's come. He's died. Here I am to preach him. And then it says, he confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus because then he proved that Jesus is the Christ. This was a truly truth encounter. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. What happens when you follow Jesus? The spirit of religion will always come and try to get rid of you. But the plot became known to Paul, uh, to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by the night and let him down through the wall in the large basket. And just an ending, I want to say this. God came and he took the worst of the worst. First, somebody died. They forgo- and he forgave this man who dwelt with this spirit of nemesis. Can you see? And because he forgave him, the whole of the spiritual realm moved. And it opened up over Paul, and now nemesis, the spirit of revenge and retribution, was under his feet. And God could change him in an instant, in three days. I mean, this is an awesome story. And he got and he came into his prophetic destiny. And that's where I want to challenge you tonight. Take, and when you buy the Bild or the Pretoria News or whatever, tomorrow is Sunday newspaper, take the worst of the worst and start praying that God will bring them into their prophetic destiny. As when we start proclaiming that, we will see how the situation around people will change. Don't talk about people. Pray for people. Cover up their sins by what you say over their lives. But I want to challenge you guys. The power of sitting here tonight, inherent in as, say, I don't know, I can't estimate. How many people are we? 80, 100, I don't know. The word says, one will put a thousand to flight. Amen? So God starts counting at 10 to the power of three. One is equal to God to 10 to the power of three. Amen? And then he says, when you are three, you are 10, or two, you are 10,000. So he goes up by another exponent. So God counts exponentially. So tonight as we're sitting here, say we're 100. We are 100 to the power of three. Does that speak to you? We are a strong army. And when you open up the newspaper tomorrow, we can pray people into the kingdom of God and into their prophetic destiny because Jesus died for every one of us. My God, help us to see that he has created people to be chosen vessels. In Jesus' name, I thank you.